When you use Ancestry every day, you pick up a few tricks. Here are my most used tricks that I use to build client trees and to help them get the most bang for their buck. Hopefully these will help you extend your family tree and save some time for you on Ancestry. I've got seven tips for you. Here we go. Tip number one has to do with your searches. Now, a lot of people really rely on their hints. They think if it doesn't show up in a hint, it's not in there, which is so not true. So let me give you an illustration. This is my teaching tree. So here we have Georgie Paston, and I've attached a few things to him. There's a lot more that have been attached in my tree. And so here we see some hints that are for him in the hints program. Now, there's quite a bit here, and that's great but there's more and let me show you. So we have 10 hints here. I'm going to do a search. I'm gonna break here for a quick little announcement. Do you need help with your genealogy research? Are you hitting brick walls? Are you totally frustrated? Or do you not know where to begin? I've opened up group and individual coaching sessions via video and they start at $35. So if you're interested, click the link below down in the description of the video and you can sign up. See you there. If I click the search right up here on the top right, I'm going to perform a new search for George. Some of the things that are going to show up here are in his hints. Here it shows me the things that I've already attached to him in the tree. But then down here, I have some things that were found for him in hints, and you'll see those by that. But as you can see, there are a lot more records and more city directories and other things. Now this 1900 census does not apply to my George. So just because I've clicked search doesn't mean that all of this is right, but there's a lot here. Now on top of that, there are additional records in Ancestry that aren't going to show up on the search. So once you've done some research and you have some parameters of where you're searching and what you're searching for, you need to also use the catalog. Go down here, go up there to search, drop down to card catalog, and then you can type in different things here that you want to search for. Um, a name is usually not gonna do it for you here. You're looking for locations or a particular type of record, um, particularly locations. But anyway, you wanna do some searches via the titles or keywords that might apply to your ancestor as well. And you're gonna find additional records that you're not gonna find the other two ways. So don't give up with just hints. There's a lot more than that. Now, the second thing that I have for you has to do also with those searches. It's part of the search features. As I mentioned a minute ago, here we see the records that are currently saved to him. And because those records are saved to him, that means that Ancestry is not gonna look for additional records in that category, like, the 1910, 1920, and 1930 census have been saved to him. So Ancestry is not going to pull any more records for George Paston in 1910, 1920, or 1930. Now, sometimes that's a problem because maybe I want to make sure that I've got the right George. Maybe I want to kind of be looking around and seeing other things. So you can go right over here to the top side and you can unclick active. And now, now it's marked that it's inactive, and that means that those records that were up there are also going to be shown here with the notation that they've been saved to my tree. But if there are other individuals by that same name, like here's another George Paston in San Francisco in 1920. And maybe I wanna look at this and see, do we have two George Pastons in the area? That's the first thing. So that tells me I need to be more careful about what I'm looking for. And the second thing is maybe he was enumerated twice. Doesn't happen a lot, but it does happen occasionally. Maybe I have the wrong record. So sometimes when I'm looking for somebody, I'm looking at that as well and I'm making that inactive. I turn that off. Now, the other thing that I want to tell you to do is to be sure that you modify your searches and you've got to just kind of play around with this. Um, you might want to add in, now I know that he lived in San Francisco and that's listed here three times because of the three census records, but maybe I know that he also lived in, in Washington state. And so that way I can search for him there. And I can say, I want to search it to exact to that state and adjacent states. One of the other things that I frequently do with women in particular is I'll change these last names. And the reason that I do that is Ancestry will automatically search for both names. If you have a husband's name in there, they'll automatically kind of search for it, but sometimes it affects the results. So sometimes I'll go in here and take out their married name and put in their 
maiden name or vice versa. And sometimes in order to make that effective, I need to remove some of these family members because that will force it into what it wants to do, not what I want it to do. So that's something else that you can look at. So you really want to be playing with this particular function. And you can also remove photos, remove family trees and other things that maybe you're not interested in right now. The other thing that I do to make it more effective, to make these searches more effective, is you've got to use these filters down here. You've just got to. And there's lots of different ways that you can use them. You can narrow down a census list to like, let's say you're looking, you have them in the 1910, 20 and 30 census. You wanna see if you can find them in 1940 or in, in 1900. Um, let's say you want to look for military records or you wanna look in newspapers and periodicals. You can select any of these and you can you can narrow things down. This is also really helpful when you're looking for um, wills and other probate records as well as land records. I might click on that. So if you haven't been playing with the filters over here on this side, that is something that you really, really, really wanna do. So make sure you get comfortable with that. Now the other thing that I really encourage people to do is to open the hint for more information and also for when you attach it to your tree. And let me explain what I mean by that. So if I click on this US CD directories, it's gonna bring it up on this side. And I said before, that I'm not a huge fan of this. I always do two things. I'll click on that and then that will open it full screen. And then the other thing that I always do is I always, always, always look at the image. I'll open that link in a new tab. And so here I have the detail that's here, but now I want to look at the actual image and I want to zoom in to George Paston and he'll be highlighted on most of these, which is really helpful on Ancestry. And I have his name Paston, G-E-O, abbreviation for George with his wife, Ama, which is correct. He was a steward on ships and that's their address. And so, but sometimes maybe the address has a different abbreviation next to it. Now, maybe I don't understand what these abbreviations mean. I can move forward and backwards within the document in order to look up some of that information. So that's the first thing. I always want to actually look at the record. And I also want to see, are there any other pastons that are, are there at this time? In 1924, there's not. He's the only one. The other reason I want to save from this screen is that on some of the records, it gives me an option when I save it to them that I could go back and do it, but that takes time and I don't want to take clients time. So I always save it this way. This is particularly true on census records. Let me show you. So here we have his census record. In 1910, he was in San Francisco, Assembly District 40 in San Francisco. He was married. He was the head of the household. Um, if I were to save that via the side panel, it wouldn't give me that marital status and any of that information down there. Now with children and stuff like that, that can be really pertinent. In addition, when I'm saving a census record via the hint, I can add in additional information. Let me give you an example. All right, so this is Georgette Past and his daughter. I know she was in the 1950 census, but she didn't come up in the 1950 census in the hints. So I've done a search and it's not coming up in the initial search functions. So I'm gonna go over here to census and voter list and I'm gonna say 1950. Wow, now I find Georgette Paston Stevenson, that's her married name and she's married at this point. Voila, first result, wasn't in the hints, didn't come up quickly on the search. So now I've got Georgette. Now I've gone over here, I'm in this window over here and if I go to save it to her, I have these functions right here. And this is one of my time-saving things. A lot of times I'll add additional information in here. I'll add like their, add their street address. I'll add an occupation. Um, I'll add if there's another family member living next door. I'll put that information there. That gives me more information on the tree when I go back to it. And that's always really helpful, particularly later on when you're looking at it again. So that's one of my big time-saving hints. All right, so my fourth hint is about adding a parent and dealing with children. And I did this on one of my other videos and I had a lot of people going, oh, wow, that's really cool. So let me tell you really quickly. So let's say Georgette has a son and he's Douglas Quam, but I don't know for sure who his father is. And so I put him in an unknown father. So I have him in the tree and this will happen a lot. Sometimes it happens by accident when Ancestry adds a family through the census records and it adds the children. A lot of times it will put children in with an unknown mother and that takes time to fix. 
when you know the mother, she's already there. Maybe she had passed away previously. Things like that will happen and they kind of drive me crazy. So for me, a quick fix, if I have children that are under an unknown mother, the first thing that I do is I add the name of their father who let's say his father is Elmer Kwan. This is not true by the way. So now I have Douglas Kwan as a son of Elmer Kwan, but then I have this Elmer Kwan here and I could have had five children underneath here, no problem. Now all I do is go to Elmer Kwan and I use the little tool button and I merge with a duplicate. And so I look for Elmer Kwan in my tree and here's the other one and I am going to merge these two. And now all of a sudden, let me go back to Georgette Paston. Now all of a sudden, George Douglas Quam is the son of Elmer Quam. That for one kid, not such a big deal. If there's eight kids, big deal. All right, so now one of my other favorites is adding a photograph to a fact. And a lot of people don't realize how easy it is to do that and I like it and the reason that I like that is it helps me to know whether or not I have the image for a particular fact or whether or not maybe I still need to get it. So I particularly like this for like birth certificates, death certificates, marriage certificates, but I wanna give you an example with a marriage and instead of the certificate, I wanna, sh I wanna put in a photograph. So if I go down here to the marriage of Georgette and George William Stevenson, I can edit that fact and then I can attach media. And so then I can look at the media that I've already attached to her and I can attach this wedding party me media and just exit back out. And now I have that marriage picture right here in this fact. I can do that with a picture of a certificate. I can do that with, with lots of different things. I really like that. If I haven't uploaded the record yet or the media yet, then I can still do it. I can attach media. And if I don't have the media, I can upload media here. And not only does that upload the media in the traditional way that you upload the media, but it also attaches it to that fact in that one step. That's another little favorite of mine. By the way, I can also attach a source to a fact. So if I click on attach source, then I can choose the source that pertains to that marriage. Like if this were the correct marriage index, I could choose that source. It's not, it's your second marriage, but I could choose that source and it would put it, it would put it up there, which now it would be a source for that fact. One of my other little tricks pertains to the tree settings. And the way you get to those is you go right up here to tree and you go to settings. All right. And I export my tree as a GEDCOM file, sometimes for my clients and as a backup for me too. And you can export your tree right here and now. A GEDCOM file is a file that can be used in any genealogy program. But you can also change privacy settings here. And here you can make your tree private, but since this is a teaching tree, it's private. But I can also prevent the tree from being found in searches. And as a professional genealogist, I need to do that because I don't want people to be looking at trees that I'm doing for clients, that's their private stuff. And so I don't, I, I do that. Um, but you can make it public, you can choose, you can do whatever you want. And then over here, you've got invitations. And now I can invite people. I can invite somebody to share my tree. I can add them by email or, give, or get a link to invite them or by their ancestry username. I can also select their role. So like those tree settings, and a lot of times people don't know those and some of the things that are kind of cool within them. All right, my last one is how do I do a census search? Now, I do a lot of census evaluations for clients where I really kind of want to get a picture of who is living in a particular area. And so that can be done by searching for them the way we had already talked about, right? Looking at their hands, searching for them, stuff like that. But sometimes I want to find all of the different individuals in a particular area by a particular name. And so a census evaluation is really helpful for me. And there's some cool ways to go about it. I'll go up here to search and I'll do a census and voter list search. And then I'm going to put in the name and I'm going to say, and I'm not going to put in a first name because I'm just looking for that surname. And I'm going to say that they lived in Miller County, Georgia. And I want to keep it exact to that county and adjacent counties. And the reason that I'm including adjacent counties is because sometimes people were enumerated. They were just like over a county line. And so sometimes they lived really close to a particular county, but some of those records like vary, right? So I usually do that. 
and then I click search. And now I'm looking, I have the census and voter list already open right here, and I'm looking at all the different Jacksons that I can find. But I don't care about in here, I wanna look at Jacksons in 1850. And so now I've got a bunch of different types of census, I just want the US federal census. And now I've narrowed this down to 31 Jacksons that lived in Baker County, Georgia, in 1850. So that gives me a good idea of what's happening in the area with that surname. That I use all the time. And that is the fastest way for me to really do a thorough census evaluation. There are occasions when that doesn't work because somebody's was their writing was so bad, the family was indexed incorrectly. But anyway, that's my favorite. So I hope these ancestry tricks have helped you. I hope that it makes your ancestry searches more effective. I hope that you save a little bit of time and that you're pleased with some of the results that you're getting from your ancestry searches and the different ways that you can update your ancestry tree. I hope you have a great day. If you want, take a look at this video right over here. It's one that YouTube is recommending for you, as well as this, as this playlist that gives you some clues on how to do better, more effective searches.